The last known eruption of the volcano was in 1857, and in the decades that followed, hardly anybody thought it would erupt again. Suddenly, in early 1980, the mountain began to show signs of life. We were just doing our normal stuff, and then uh, one day we got a notice that uh, that Mount St. Helens was becoming active and we were to, to leave the area for a while, until, at least until they could understand. And the first notice was some very deep, long earthquakes that indicated, because they were right under the mountain, that it was something occurring inside of the mountain. As days followed and the mountain cleared up, we started seeing some cracks forming, very large cracks uh, forming in the mountain, and then day after day there began a buildup and what we didn't know what was happening but there was a magma pool forming in the mountain. The mountain uh, first became active in uh, March, March 20th. There was one seismometer and the folks from the University of Washington seismology lab uh, went down and confirmed that there was earthquake activity so there was some scrambling that went on as the earthquake activity built to establish additional seismometers around the volcano. For those who grew up in the Pacific Northwest, the sight of a volcano's snow-capped peaks always brought a sense of awe and beauty, but hardly ever a feeling of danger. I can remember being in a classroom and we were talking about the Cascade Mountains and being told Mount St. Helens was a dormant volcano. I never imagined it ever had the potential for doing what it did. A lot of these guys have been around here all their lives. Uh, families that homesteaded in the valley here. Stories of, of you know, their dads and granddads that had worked out here also. So the general feeling was this was not gonna be anything big. I mean, everybody's got a volcano that's idling somewhere around them, you know, but nobody expects to ever have to deal with it or, or be there when it happens. Because it's, you know, hundreds or thousands of years in between. I'd be long gone before that thing would ever erupt. That's what we used to talk about. Of course, there are some people who are not all that surprised when the mountain came alive. If you know where to look, there's evidence all over this area of past eruptions, such as Silver Lake, which is the product of a mud flow from a long time ago. On the south side of Mount St. Helens, um, we have the Ape Caves and the Cave Basalt Lava Flows, which are a tremendous attraction. And they're from a, a one period, as far as we know, in Mount St. Helens history, about a couple thousand years ago, when Mount St. Helens did produce a more mafic, uh, deeper flowed magma, these basaltic eruptions. You can find ash from Mount St. Helens uh, from past eruptions way up in Canada. So it's been a major ash producer, and, and uh, these vertical, large vertical ashfall eruptions have been uh, an important occurrence in the past. With the knowledge of past eruptions, scientists went to work on trying to estimate what could happen next. There was a, a lot of discussion, as you can imagine, about what the mountain was doing and what it was not. They thought that we would have a vertical blast, that all past eruptions indicated that that's what Mount St. Helens does. And what we knew was that this volcano could explode and, and was known for explosive eruptions. Visibly, the mountain was changing, and, and as it changed, I think, even the people that have worked here a long time start realizing that this is not normal. Still didn't anticipate what actually did happen. And what geologists tell us is that the magma was rising, the hot molten rock was rising within the volcano as it came up into this very wet snow cone of a mountain, was drying out the inside of the mountain and there was pressurized steam which was erupting out of the summit. After the initial steam eruptions, scientists put more instruments on or near the mountain to try to figure out what was going to happen next and how soon. To their great alarm, St. Helens began to grow. The instrumentation at that time, you know, 30 years ago, was much more primitive than we have today. As a matter of fact, a fairly new instrument available to the geologists at the time were these laser rangefinders, surveying device. Uh, and they actually had uh, a new one that they had purchased that they brought up to Mount St. Helens and they were putting um, targets, prisms, on the side of the volcano and shooting a laser beam at them and at very precise timing it would time the speed that it took the light to go fore and back. 
These things are set up to measure millimeters of motion, like the growth of your fingernail type rate. They were getting parts of a meter of motion. It was moving, you know, five feet a day. And they thought the instruments were, uh, were incorrect. So they sent the instrument back to be recalibrated. And no, it was correct, and it was swelling at that rate. It doesn't take any kind of a scientist, really, to tell you that if the side of a mountain is growing by several feet a day, that something really bad's going to happen. The mountain was being split into two by the rising magma, and this tremendous bulge appeared um, throughout late March and April, and that ultimately is what collapsed. With imminent danger on a magnitude never seen before, authorities redoubled their efforts to get people out of harm's way. But a few chose to stay despite the danger, most notably Harry Truman. He was a stubborn old guy. He just was going to stay there. It wasn't going to happen, you know. And he either loved him or hated him. Even those outside the red zone were warned of possible danger and to be prepared. Authorities knew the mountain was ready to do something but what and when was beyond anyone's wildest guess. I think those people who were trying to prepare for the worst case scenario had no idea that their worst case scenario was better than the one that we got. When we return, Mount St. Helens unleashes its full fury in a nine hour massive eruption.